on the road we've traveled and the road we have yet to travel. We've had a very difficult and challenging legislative session that we've just completed, and that has resulted in a lot of painful cuts for all of us. Uh, but I think we need to really just put a stop on focusing on the past and really look to tomorrow. Because I believe that there is a bright tomorrow in store for the University of North Dakota if we focus on the future that the strategic plan sets out. The strategic planning committee, 45 members that got together over the last uh, eight, 10 months to bring this plan to fruition. Let's have the 45 members that are here please stand so we can recognize them. And in total, we had over 800 people engaged in the process. The largest group was faculty, but staff and community members and administration and dean were all brought into the process. Uh, we started out by saying, what are we here for? What are we here for as the University of North Dakota? And ultimately, we're here for students and for our state. And we said, what is our purpose? What are we trying to do? We want to be the chief opportunity engine for North Dakota and for those students by delivering them opportunity in the form of learning, discovery, and engagement. We think we best do that by fulfilling our vision to be the premier flagship in the Northern Plains. Flagships as in the university ofs within a, you know, within a state just like we are. And we started next to focus on what are the core values that we hold as the University of North Dakota. Had a wide degree of engagement about that and in the end came up with these six core values. And really from there, we took those core values and said, if these are our core values, what then should we focus on for our strategic goals? They came out of the core values. But first we did a SWOT analysis. Uh, what are our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats? And just focusing for a second on the threats. The threats begin with the fact that there is free online content from elite universities delivered with digitally enabled experiences that we are competing against. If you want to get Harvard on your resume, just go to edX. You can take a MOOC, a massively online open course. If you pay a few hundred dollars, you can perhaps get a certificate that you took that course. If you prefer to get your, your, uh, your thing from resume, uh, your resume item from Stanford, or even better yet, maybe Michigan, uh, you can go to Coursera. If you want to learn more about art history, Maybe Khan Academy can give that to you. So the main threat is that affordable Ivy League content is available in Paris or Grand Forks or Williston or any other place around the world. And content has become ubiquitous everywhere, uh, low cost or free. The second threat is that the primacy of traditional degrees is under threat. If you look at Udacity.com over in the left-hand corner, if you want to for Facebook, click that and it'll tell you, here's the handful of nano degrees that Facebook wants you to take. Or you can go to Google or IBM or Lockheed Martin. Uh, my son took one of these courses for $450 on deep computing. As part of that, he had access to a supercomputer for five projects that he designed and ran as part of it. So they're highly experiential, very well polished. And if you go, as you see in the circled area here, and get a nano degree plus program, they guarantee if you don't get a job within six years, six months, that you get all your tuition back. Uh, you know, you find yourself five years down the road that your, your skills need retooling, just go back, click on the nano degrees you need to be to be current, and go back and do it. So these nano degrees are in many ways beginning to undermine the demand for the traditional degrees. The next thing is that competition for traditional degrees is also increasing and accelerating. Georgia Tech is offering a $7,000 master's in computer science, very affordable degree from a very reputable institution. But if you look at Arizona State, they now serve 24,000 students online. That's double what they had two years ago. So they basically added a University of North Dakota in the last couple of years, and their stated goal is to be 100,000. Now, in a relatively flattish market for credit hours across the uh, country, who's that coming from? You look at Purdue, just recently bought Kaplan 
University, an online provider with 32,000 students and 15 campuses. What's to prevent Purdue from opening up a campus in Fargo or in, in Bismarck or in Grand Forks and start offering courses uh, with some face-to-face -face elements? I can tell you when I was at George Washington University, New York University came and established a, a presence basically right across the street from George Washington University. It is becoming a very competitive marketplace. And as they're saying, this act by Purdue is really legitimizing in many ways the online degrees. A book I read recently, The Second Machine Age, said digital technologies have aided the transition to winner take all. They're saying, why would you take a course from a star when you could instead take it from a superstar? And when you're looking at music or movies or online courses, why settle for the second best? And if you look at these providers online, if they have 500 students in Accounting 101, they have one professor for those 500 students. And each block of 15 to 25 has an instructional aide helping the students through the course, but they're not putting their second best a professor of Accounting 101 in another course side by side. They're going with the best, and that's what we're going to be up against. So being second best for a course or a degree is of diminishing value in this increasingly competitive age. The second thing is that reduced state funding and the focus on student debt is putting a greater and greater pressure on us, like everybody else in the economy, to do more for less. It was interesting to me that when I woke up after we just went through this 20% cut in state funding, that the key concern from our good friends at the Grand Forks Herald was is that we needed to have a greater focus on student debt. Uh, with Tom Dennis saying that that would answer one of the root concerns amongst taxpayers, which is that higher education has become selfish. Uh, so this is our hometown paper, much less uh, uh, a paper from a town that doesn't have a major university based in it. And it's because of this pressure that as I was going to Reno to watch our a men's basketball team and women's basketball team compete in the tournaments. As I went through the security, the tray has University of Nevada bragging that our faculty is 32% more productive than other tier one universities. University of Reno knows that being more productive than your competitive universities is something they need to do. If you go to Reno or if you go to Las Vegas, there's a difference between table stakes and opportunity to win. You have to have a certain number of chips that you put on the table, a certain number of chips to get a seat at the table. And only after that can you bet to win. So if you look at quality content, which we have great quality content, we have fabulous professors here teaching good courses, name brand, which we have, more for less, which we need to continue to focus on, those are just table stakes. And if you look at Clay Christensen, he said that 15 years from now, Half the universities existing in America today are not going to exist. Now, we might say that's just all fanciful, but if you go to this website on New England colleges, when I went through the list of colleges that had closed, the list aggregated more than 90. And if you look at CBS Pittsburgh reporting here, Pennsylvania considering whether they have to close colleges, they listed uh, five of them here. Indiana University of Pennsylvania is a funny sounding name for a university but they are older and as of 2010 were bigger than the University of North Dakota and there's talk on reputable news outlets like CBS about they may need to close. Now they perhaps didn't close this year but that's this year. What about two years from now or four years from now or six years from now as this digital competition becomes ever more significant? They say that 63 percent of the universities missed their enrollment targets last year, 84 percent are concerned with meeting their target for this year, you could say that University of North Dakota is in that bucket. Because if you look at from 2012, we've been on a downward trajectory of credit hours delivered. Now, if you think of the budget cuts we went through today, we've got 8,000 less credit hours today than we did in 2012. And if we had 8,000 more credit hours being delivered today, we'd have more students in our classroom, more opportunities for teachers, all of those good things. We've been suffering from this missing target. The big challenge we need to think of, if you think of Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Tipping Point, where he said a tipping point is that magical moment 
when the, an idea, a trend, a social behavior crosses the threshold, tips, and spreads like wildfire. Everybody says it's never going to happen, it's never going to happen, and boom. Everybody says we should have thought it coming. Interestingly, Mike Jacobs, a good friend of UND, a graduate of UND, a good friend of liberal arts, a good friend of higher education, reporting what he's hearing in Bismarck, saying that quite a few of the Main Street eminences who believe that government is okay as long as it's working doubt that North Dakota's higher education system passes this bar, that campuses are no longer are necessary because knowledge is pervasive. You perhaps read the governor's review yesterday in his interview with the Grand Forks Herald. This chatter is increasing in intensity and frequency. At what point does it become just the tipping point and everybody accepts it? Is that two years from now, four years from now, six years from now, eight years from now? Those are the concerns that we need to have. And I think it's important that we wake up and smell the coffee and recognize that if that tipping point comes, if all of a sudden parents don't believe that having their kids spend four years at the University of North Dakota or any other university and spending four years of tuition here is going to live them, is going to create a good lifetime for them, unlike the Great Flood, you're not going to be able to rebuild from that. And so if you're saying, you know, Mark, uh, this is really, you're being too negative. I don't think it's really that bad. Uh, if you're wrong, we aren't going to have a recovery moment. So I think we need to always ask ourselves when we're pressing and asking questions, is that a 55-foot question or is that a 49-foot question? And frankly, how do we me measure this? And who do we compare ourselves against? If we're going to be the premier flagship of the Northern Plains, we want to compare ourselves to the premier flagships that we're competing against, Idaho, Montana, South Dakota, and Wyoming. And so our goal here is we're going to start retaking the course of college learning assessment CLA Plus, which is designed to test these skills and set a goal for ourselves that we're going to be better than those other flagships in the region. In each case, we also have a captain, and that captain will ultimately build a team. And the captain for this is none other than Debbie Storrs, recently promoted to senior vice president, but continues to be deans of arts and sciences. You're going to be more holistically innovative. But on the flip side, Wall Street Journal recently had an article, Liberal Arts College in a Fight for Survival Focus on Job Skills, and some are requiring humanities students to take math or statistics course. So if we bolt on more of a focus on analytics onto our humanities degrees, they're going to be more employable. So it's really crossing both ways. We're really, in many ways, moving into a world of and. It's not liberal arts or more occupational. It's and that we need to be preparing our students for as we go forward. We've had a, a strong tradition of promoting active learning. We need to continue to promote that active learning. And we also need to take the attitude that we are the same quality online as we are face-to-face. Now, another person I talked to that had taken one of our online courses had said that they paid twice as much as my son did for Udacity.com. And when I asked uh, how they liked it, they said, I really didn't need to listen to the lectures because they were straight out of the book. That's not the kind of experiential learning that we would be satisfied in a classroom. We should not be satisfied with it online. So I think there's opportunities to expand online, but we need to take a very critical eye towards every presentation of education coming out of the University of North Dakota and hold it to the same high standards. Second goal, increase graduation rates. If you look on average from the APLU, somebody graduating from a place like University of North Dakota has about $25,000 in debt, about the price of a low price Chevy uh, loan, but they get a million dollars more over a lifetime. So we're giving them a 40 to 1 payback. So when you look at affordability and you look at the fact that during the peak of the recession, the unemployment rate amongst college grad was half that of other people. And if you look at the fact that 99% of the jobs created since the last recession require at least some college, the best way we can answer Tom Dennis's concern about affordability is to make sure they graduate. Because if they graduate, they're going to get a great return on their degree. If they don't, less so. So we are looking to increase our four-year graduation rate from 28% to 34% over this five-year period, and that has to be a key focus for all of us, particularly if we're going to deliver that opportunity to our students. So understand that six-year graduation rates and retention are also something we're going to look at it. 
the way I look at it is a four-year graduation is putting the basketball through the hoop, a six years hitting the rim, the retention rate is jumping up, which you need to do to get it in the hoop. Uh, but if we're shooting for the four-year graduation rate, we're going to have to have and achieve retention rates and, and better six-year graduation rates as we go along. The captain in this case is going to be Hasham El Rouini. And examples of action steps are starfish adaptation tied to faculty contracts, which is shown to be a great way to make sure that we're not just giving them good information in the classroom, but we're getting them the graduation that we're going to be using predictive analytics to target interventions at just the right time with just the right intervention for our students to get them across the line and tie that to the review of the advisees. We're looking for outbound calling schedule. For example, if they haven't signed up for spring yet, but they were here in the fall, put a group of people on phones and call them and say, can I help you? Well, you know, what's the, is there a challenge? What's the stumbling block I can help you through? Degree Planner is the software that we're going to try to implement here in the relatively near future. I can tell you all four of my kids got through college in four years. Part of it was because I negotiated with them before they were born, <laughs> which I advise you is the best time to negotiate with your children. And I, I said to them, uh, no dating before you're 16, and dad pays for three-fourths of the first four years you, of any school you can get into. Uh, 50 years on you, but the other thing is all four of my kids at every stage in their, their college career, we had a full four-year plan of what classes they would take. They decided they really didn't want to take that one. They were sliding in a different one. We'd look at the plan and make sure that it was in place. So that degree planner is a software that would allow students to do that, but also have the advisees have access to that all along the way. We also need to focus on DFWs. D's, F's, and withdraws that have shown to be a big stumbling block to get them to the finish line. Where are they coming from? How can we stop them? How can we intervene? And we need to look at other roadblocks to success along the way to get them to graduation and have a bigger focus on 15 to finish and other comparable things at the graduate programs. So here we have Hasham giving you his insight. Helping students succeed is at the heart of everything we do here at the University of North Dakota. Our goal is to enrich the student experience inside and outside the classroom. Our faculty and staff work hard to ensure that all students have a clear path toward graduation. Through academic tools, personal interactions, and financial advising, we are committed to helping our students find success at UND and beyond. Thank you, Hisham. Moving on to our third goal, deliver more educational opportunities online and on campus, which I think we can do. We're going to be doing this by increasing credit hours by 10% is our goal over the 10-year period. But remember what I just told you, that we've been on a downward trend. And even though we hope that when it comes to fall enrollment that we're up, that added into a pool that's going to go down means we're going to continue to be down this year. It's going to be a Herculean effort to flatten it out in the next year and start it going up in the third year. We haven't laid out what the exact numbers are, but just recognize that's coming. But it's first arresting the decline, flattening it out, and moving it up, which is the goal we're trying to move on to. Uh, we're going to be having the new VP of Marketing and Communications that will be moving into the position that Peter Johnson now sits in when he retires. We don't have that person. And in the meantime, I'm going to continue the weekly marketing meetings that I've been having. And the other place where I see this opportunity come from is online. So I'm going to start having regular meetings to talk about which online degrees can we really expand. If you look at part of what we're doing on marketing, we're going through a branding exercise, which isn't going to roll out till later on this summer. I think you're going to like it when it comes out. But University of Louisville, uh, Louisville, as they say down there, uh, recently consolidated their brand, and they had a 38% increase in donor giving, 8% increase in overall revenue, 22% increase in out-of-state uh, enrollment. And with all the challenges we've gone through over the brand of University of North Dakota, I think there's an even bigger bump for us. When you look at our website, right now, on an on a iPhone, it looks exactly the same as it does on a PC. 
Uh, most universities are already into mobile-friendly websites or what they call platform-aware. It knows whether it's speaking to an iPad, an iPhone, or a PC. And if you look at the significant increases that have resulted from those universities that have switched from where we are to a more uh, responsive platform, I'm particularly interested in 21% of the students accepting officer, offers go up. Because if you get an offer from UND and you get that on an iPhone that looks like a PC, you're saying, I consider myself a hip with it on the front edge of technology. Clearly, they're not, so why would I go there? There's little things like that that we're communicating that I think this can really help us to do. We're in the process of that. It may not roll out until at the end of next uh, spring, but I think when that does, it's going to have an impact. We're already started landing pages that are mobile friendly, that do bring on key selling points, that are integrated with our customer relationship management program for a number of our programs, and we're finding significant benefit from that. We've started our digital advertising. Most of what we're going to be doing in advertising, you're not going to be seeing in paper because we're moving from a paper to a digital world. But in all of these advertisements, you get a high degree of analytics of how many of those people saw it, of those people who saw it, how many went and applied, how many went and ultimately enrolled, and you're going to be critically evaluating all of the marketing that you're doing. Uh, and so uh, Sarah and our marketing team have been doing a great job of moving us forward on this. We need to upgrade our recruiting software to make sure that all the different people talking to students, professors, uh, admissions people, et cetera, are connected into the same conversation. And we're going to be conducting a review and interviewing some outside par parties about can they come in like they have in Arizona State and other universities and, and bring a more significant presence online. They charge a slice of the, of the revenue, but typically that's reflective of the services that they're delivering, and there's an opportunity there. We're hoping to add more programming in cyber and analytics, both of which I think are going to be high-growth programs and high opportunities for existing students and hopefully attracting new students. We need to do a better job as we've begun to do with transfer students. Sometimes it's a very cumbersome process for a student to transfer into the University of North Dakota. We're going to be having our admissions be more analytic driven in terms of where they're directing their time. And we need to continue to look at refining our scholarships to make sure that they're doing the best job they can of attracting people here. And I'm going to talk about two other areas that I believe are important to attracting students to the University of North Dakota. I do believe that athletics continue to be a front porch of university, that bring people to our campus, get them to see all the great things we have inside. And I'm always looking when I'm at these games how many 14-year-olds and 17-year-olds are out there in the, in the stands that are beginning to love University of North Dakota. Uh, when you have 1.4 million viewers uh, watching uh, our boys uh, get more points against Arizona than anybody else besides UCLA, that's a good thing for the University of North Dakota. We've done four steps towards uh, getting athletics uh, right on the path we want. We have four more steps to go. The first is the name and logo uh, transition. We need to have, as I was explaining to some person giving me a 20-minute lecture on our past logo at our, uh, at our Champions Ball last weekend, I said, it's my job as President of the United States to have this <laughs> President of something even greater than the United States, <laughs> University of North Dakota. We'll get into this. My next lecture will be on what the President of the United States should be doing. Uh, it's my job as President of Uni University of North Dakota to have this generation of students be as passionate about the Hawks as you are about the logo you had here. There's no way we're going to engender that kind of alumni connection to the university unless we get that done, and uh, unless we do that. And so interestingly, he went to his table and gave the same lecture to the people at the table, came up to me a little bit the sheepish afterwards and said, I was telling that to my table, and the three athletes sitting at the table said to me, we're hawks. So it's beginning to happen. You know, when we say, why do, there's a, there's a big payback from getting students to love the hawks. We been talking about getting in the right conference for forever. Uh, being at home with our natural rivals, uh, that's done, and we're on the path to doing that. Uh, we've had the right size to D1. Very, very painful process. I heard a lot when I came here, when we moved to D2 to D1, 
we can't really afford D1 and the expense that it requires for the left space of sports we're offering. That was painful for me, painful for others, but I think sets up in a better position for athletics overall. We've demonstrated D1 competitiveness. I haven't heard of another university that has won four conference championships in the same year right after winning a hockey national championship. I'm, I'm, I'm learning more about the Grand Forks community because everybody's still down at Adopter because we didn't get into the Final Four uh, for the Frozen Four. But we need to recognize that we have a lot of great teams and we are competitive at Division I. But what do we need to do? We're going to need to make sure we rebalance given the adjustments we've made. We're going to need to make sure we fundraise that the High Performance Center has been great and added wonderful. Uh, uh, Bubba was talking about 30 new records in track and field since we've added this. But we need to get the second piece done because right now, if you've been through our men's football locker, Pequot Lakes High School has better lockers than we do at the University of North Dakota, and we need to correct that. We need to have a university-wide apparel deal. For us to take the next step in getting people to love the Hawks, they want to be wearing what they see the athletes and what they see the coaches wearing, and that can only be done with the university-wide apparel deal, which is another complicated negotiation we're going to have to go through in the months ahead. And we need to make our football game day experience comparable to or better the Fargo Dome experience. So we'll be announcing a committee that will address that here in the relatively near future. Campus. I do believe that we not only have the best and prettiest campus in North Dakota, agreeing with travel and leisure, but beyond that. I think the bones of our campus are amongst the beautiful, most beautiful campus I've ever seen. But the bones are getting a little tired. And uh, the average building is 50 years old, and we're nearly $500 million in deferred maintenance, which four medical school equivalents of deferred maintenance. So even though we're making a bigger push online, and even though some folks don't think that a campus makes a difference anymore, I just want to show you that Penn State World Campus is their website for their online programs. And what are they showing on their online website? They're showing bricks and mortar. It's bricks and mortar that develops the brand that you sell online, that you bring students here and face-to-face. -face. We need to get our online looking sharp. Uh, that's going to require an all-of-the-above approach. Luckily, we have a lot of brand-new buildings. Uh, Robin Hall, mostly funded by private donations. Medical school, a gift from the legislature and the governor. Uh, the Collaborative Energy Center, a big beneficiary of the matching program, but a lot of private donations. We've remodeled some classrooms and need to continue and finish that effort the second floor of the library, the old med school uh, to move uh, some of our people in there out of other buildings. We've had two properties that we've listed for sale. We've taken a number else offline. We have eight set to remove this summer, and we have some more apartments that we've uh, on, on plan to remove the year after that. We're exploring the contracting for steam. I'm saying we're not in the steam business. We can't afford to take capital dollars to redo our steam plant. Let's buy it from somewhere else and get it off the quad so we can look all around the quad and see beautiful sites. Uh, but we've also focusing on this Cooley to Columbia committee that is moving forward and thinking about how do we make our main street nicer?